Today, I have with us Jennifer Hamity, a voice coach and board certified therapist specializing in the technical and emotional issues that can interfere with self-expression. Her clients include Glam Grammy, American Music, Country Music Award winners, contestants on The Voice, and American Idol, performers in the Emmy Award-winning productions, and of course, corporate clients in a variety of industries. She's also authored a number of books and writes regularly in psychology today. Welcome, Jennifer. Always like to get things started with learning a little bit about your journey and what got you to your current passion. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be with you. To try to make a long story short, I started my career as a professional singer. That's all I ever wanted to do. When I was in college, I had already been singing professionally, but really struggled with the technical training, something that had always been very intuitive to me, uh, became something that I was being asked to think about and compartmentalize. And long story short, it caused a lot of problems for me. It caused me to have tension and pain, uh, physical and emotional in my performing. And as I unraveled that, I realized that I could help many other people who started with this more intellectual approach to performance and singing get to where I was returning to. So um, throughout my career as a performer, I toured and, and traveled and worked on records and in the studio. I also was writing about these issues. Uh, my first book came out and very organically, as I got older, I started moving from performer to coach to author. And here I am today. And my practice, as you alluded to, has expanded from singers to performers and now to working with professionals and executives on all manner of self-expression, getting out of the way any physical and emotional tensions and crimps that block us from just being able to be present and self-expressed. You know, what are some of the most common blocks or emotional issues that impact people? Do you mean specifically singers or anyone? Well, They're very different. Well, singers, you can expand to everyone as well. Yeah. Well, I think with singers, what's unique about singers is that the issues, which tend to be more common to all of us, and I'll go into that, it's how they manifest. You know, as singers, because our instruments are inside of our bodies, the way we breathe, the way we speak, you know, our, our nervousness or insecurities will manifest in ways that become very obvious when we then go to sing. Whereas you and I speaking right now, for example, might feel insecure or uncomfortable, but we can mask it more easily in our speaking voices. So um, that's a particular challenge with singers. I've worked with violinists who have the same thing. It just manifests in shaking hands, you know, uh, nervousness that way. But the issues, I think, tend to be largely the same. I think that most self-expression issues, I'm generalizing, but just in my experience, they tend to be uh, related to an unwillingness or a discomfort with being vulnerable and intimate with people. The larger the barrier uh, between me and you, uh, the fear we have of other people being judged, wanting to be liked, et cetera, tends to be what makes people clam up, get nervous, and start to really overthink um, and intellectualize rather than being with someone where you can really be in the moment and flow and have conversations that really matter and make a difference. Now, what tips do you have, though, to overcome that fear of being judged and what have you? Yeah, well, that's that's a life's work, of course, right? That's the life work we're all doing. But there's it's a two prong approach that I encourage people to take. I think one of the most underestimated and easiest things that we can do is to do more of that which frightens us. So, for example, whether it's a singer or a public speaker 
or a podcast interviewer or um, someone interested in going on dates or meeting people, you know, when we spend more time in our heads thinking about and worrying about those things and less time actually doing them, that's where the anxiety not only builds up, but starts to calcify and takes on a life of its own. So I think it's really important to get out there and sing or speak or engage, interact, practice. Even in COVID, I was encouraging my clients to get on Zoom with family or friends, neighbors, and say, hey, can I give this presentation to you three times this week? I'll buy you a bottle of wine or something. And it's amazing how that sort of fight or flight, that animalistic you know, part of us, once we start normalizing something through practice, it goes, oh, I've done this before five times and I didn't die. Okay. And we start to calm down. So there's that, the practical application to your question. The other thing I think, though, is to, to the best of our abilities as people to reframe the way we view relationships. I think that we all come, of course, we're <laughs> people run the gamut, but I think that the notion that self-protection and avoiding vulnerability are the same is mistaken. I find that the more open and vulnerable I am, the more able I am to be mindful of all that's going on around me. So encouraging people to maybe look newly at what strength, interpersonal strength and personal strength really mean. I think when we spend our time being guarded and trying to protect ourselves from whatever, we actually end up more vulnerable in a pejorative sense and more easily hurt um, and certainly less self-expressed. Well, one thing I certainly have struggled with, and you give good advice, is you do just have to get out there doing it. Because I've always said, if I'm not embarrassed with my early work, then I'm not improving. (laughs) That's really well said. It reminds me, and stop me if we're running out of time or anything, I worked with an amazing recording engineer in my performance career named Al Schmidt, who's since passed away, sadly. And I remember I was kind of complaining as we were mixing this project that I didn't sound exactly the way that I wanted to sound. And he looked at me and said, Jennifer, every recording is just a capturing of one moment in time. And I try to, I think that was wise beyond the, the context of recording, of course. We to your point, are always growing, always learning. You know, if we want to be perfect, whatever that is now, you know, there is no such thing, first of all. And of course, you know, without evolution, we're not learning and growing. So yeah, yours is, your point is well taken. Now, in one of your blogs, you compared a client you were working with, with compound interest. Can you get into that a little bit as it relates to singing or speaking or just self-improvement? Yes, that's uh, yeah, that piece, I think specifically was that was about a client I had been working with a singer and he he's an amazing man. And what I was referring to is how when we began to work together, I wasn't certain that he was going to reach his vocal goals. He was tenacious, hardworking. He really wanted it and was putting in the work, but there wasn't a lot of pro. He didn't seem to be making the kind of progress that he or I wanted him to make up front, at least. But he always had such a positive attitude and he was always willing to put in the work and putting in the work. And then it was, you know, a couple months down the road, it was as if his progress just exploded, you know, and thus the compound interest reference that, you know, at the beginning where you have to be investing, you have to be putting in the work, you have to be putting in the practice, you have to stay committed and determined And if you do so, while you might not see the type of exponential results day to day, in time, they do emerge. Now, I would imagine perfectionists exist all over the place in the world of performers. And there's that fine line between, you know, pursuing perfect, being helpful, and then having it be sabotaging. How do you navigate a client through that? Well, 
First, I think it's important to, to point out that language for me is so powerful. And I think we under generally uh, in our culture and certainly in, in teaching, I find that language is underestimated, the power of language. For example, the word perfectionist or perfect has for some people very negative connotations, right? You know, being a perfectionistic person, not being in the moment, fixated. But to your point, I think that you're alluding to there, there can be benefits to, to wanting to strive for perfection. So the first thing I think is to look at our language, all of our language, and make sure that the words we're using really serve us. But to the concept of perfectionism, however you want to language, language it specifically, I think that the, the root of that tree is really about self-worth. So if we are striving for perfection because we love what we do, we're passionate about what we do, we want to make a difference with what we do, we have a sense of joy and play, and we just want to stay up all night working on it to get it to be as perfect as it can be, that's one, you know, one experience, but a very different experience, even if uh, we use the same language as someone who, for whatever reason, feels inadequate or received praise for this creative act and feels that they have to do it to please or prove, then that same striving is not necessarily in service to the art or whatever it is that we were moving toward. The desire for perfection is to fill a void that has nothing to do with our creativity. So that's a long answer to your question, but I, I think it depends on the intrinsic motivator of that striving for uh, perfection. That's where we have to look. Now, what kind of questions are clients coming to you asking, but what questions should they be asking? Well, that is, that's a great question. Most, many clients come to me asking how that's why well, I wish I had more time to really think that through. I'll probably email you after with some, some other ideas, but generally people come to me saying, I don't think I'm good enough. How can I be better? Some version of that, right? Something's wrong. Maybe not wrong is not a word they use, but here's where I am. Help me go farther. Here's where I am. Something's not right. I want to be somewhere else. And maybe the question instead that would better serve them on that, in that pursuit would be help, help me to learn what I need to know to get myself where I want to go. I think uh, a lot of people reach for, reach out to experts, you know, quote unquote experts, you know, I'm a, I'm a voice coach, I'm also a therapist. And so I'm coming to you to look for knowledge that I assume I don't have. And in my experience, while, of course, we all have our unique training and, and experience, uh, we really learn optimally in every area of life when we take it on as a matter of personal responsibility and really have the confidence to know that we can drive or co-drive that ship. I really look at my work as a partnership as a work of partnership with people. So to round out your question about what questions should people ask, that's a lot of where we start is helping to reframe the notion of from me being someone who's going to help you with what you want to, we're going to be a team working at this and you're going to have to work as hard as I am. And I'm really more of a mirror than sort of a, a resource filled with answers. Now, maybe this is an awful question, but <laughs> <Try me. laughs> as a performer and you're dedicated to a dream, when I hate to say give up on the dream, but how do you know when you're going to make it or not, or if you have the talent? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's an awful question. I think that's a question most people want to ask, but are afraid to ask. I'm, of course, one opinion. I think that, first of all, people have to decide for themselves, back to the partnership model, what making it means for them in this moment. And then in this moment, you know, we live in a time today where people don't have one career, they have many careers. 
So making it at 18 might feel very different than making it at 35, certainly different than at 57, right? So there's that allowing ourselves the flexibility of, of recognizing, which can be hard at a young age, I think, that we live many lives. You know, it's not just like I'm going to, I have a dream and I want to be doing it in 70 years. So there's that. But I think practically, the practicality of such a heartfelt question is that I encourage people to come up with sort of micro agendas. So for example, let's say someone gets out of college and wants to be on Broadway, but they're not sure. And is this the right career? Is this what I should do? And I'll say, why don't you give it, pick a time, three years, go to New York, audition, train, give it absolutely everything you've got. You can reassess after maybe a year and a half, but don't even entertain notions of giving up until then. And after three years, then do your final reassessment. Have you made it? If not, do you feel that you're close? You know, speak with people that you trust, people in the industry who can give you honest feedback. I think the the biggest thing we want to avoid in life is regret. So I think it's better to strive for something longer and harder than maybe logic or reason would dictate. Because looking back, you'll regret more having given up, being prudent, getting the right job. I think then you'll, I've never met anyone who said, oh, I'm so upset I gave that another four years trying to get my record deal. I've never met that person, actually. Yeah. Now, whether you're singing or giving a speech to your boss, you know, trying to bring some life to it and your own personality mm-hmm. can make all the difference. Mm-hmm. How do you work with people to get that? out of them and not be stiff or Mm -hmm. stilted? Well, back to vulnerability. And again, like perfectionism, that's a, can be a challenging word for people. It can have sort of a negative twinge tinge for me. Vulnerability is a very positive, admirable thing. But I think that when we are different people at home and with our friends and at work, to use your example, I think that presents challenges. I think that the the goal in my work with people, if it, to the extent that it feels comfortable, is to encourage them to find sort of their true north, their true center, their embodied who I am and how and when I'm most comfortable. And then to find, to bring that to every area of their lives. That doesn't mean, again, that, you know, you're going to you know, be the same person in the boxers on the couch with the beers, you're going to be in a board meeting. But in essence, yes, you're the same person. And so to answer your question specifically, when we have those things compartmentalized out, then I think we go looking for tips and tricks and techniques on how to overcome that obstacle to sound engaged, to look intelligent, to come across the right way. When really in our being, our natural way of being, those things are largely lying in wait for us to pay attention to, maybe nurture a little bit, maybe augment in certain ways. Practically to your question, I I think it can be very helpful to record ourselves So I know a lot of people don't like the sound of their voice or to see themselves on video, but it's only when we do, you know, here we are in a video right now, watching this back, I'll be able to to see, did I say, you know, and so what were my hands doing? Did I seem effective? Was I really present with you and your questions? Those are things we can't know in real time the same way that we can know when we're watching back. So I think that it's an incredible, incredible tool to watch ourselves objectively and, and then kind of see what's missing for ourselves and maybe also for some, from some other people we trust and then work on that. But to work on it from a place that is authentic to us, for example, if we feel like we need to be louder, we're not, our voices aren't carrying, we don't want to then just try to be louder. You know, we might want to ask ourselves, Is there a reason? Am I nervous? Am I holding back my volume? Am I afraid to speak up? Am I thinking, which is a good thing, but maybe then when I'm finished thinking, I can come with a little more confidence in the way I uh, share my thought. So again, having those questions come from within and the results rise from within us, who we are, the fullness of who we are. 
Now, always like to ask my guests, if you could go back in time, what is the one piece of advice you would give your younger self? You have some really wonderful questions. Well, I'd I'd ideally like to have a lot of time and give myself a lot of advice, but (laughs) I think that if I could give myself one piece of advice, it would be you have nothing to prove and you never did. And your only job is to live. That is a wonderful way to segue to if people want to work with you or get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? Yes, and please, I I look forward to it. Uh, My website is findingyourvoice.com. All my contact info, social media, email, uh, information, books, articles are there. So findingyourvoice.com. Well, thank you so much today, Jennifer. Oh, it's, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me.